Hello, everybody. It is good to see you again. Good to be with you tonight, and I'm glad we can study the book of Acts again. And some of you know we are heading out of town tomorrow as a family heading up to Ironwood, Michigan again. Uh, yesterday, we ate the last two pasties out of our freezer, so it is time to replenish the supply. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to go up to Joe's Pasty Shop in Ironwood from time to time, and we try to go back there on a regular basis. I was there in February doing some winter camping, and uh, we replenished the supply with about three dozen frozen pasties that I brought back with me. It's kind of easy to transport pasties when it's 16 below zero like it was back in February of this year up north. And we are right at the end of that stash, and so it is time to head back up there. As you might know, a pasty is basically a meat potato pocket pie. That's the only way I can explain it. Uh, sometimes made with rutabagas and onions and carrots and who knows what else, but the concept was brought over to Michigan's Upper Peninsula back in the 1800s from, from England, and it was brought there by the copper and iron miners. And they would bake those pies early in the morning. They would keep those in their pockets to eat underground mid through, midway through their shift in the mines. And so to this day, the UP is known for pasties. We do have a pasty shop here in Madison. We used to have two that I knew of. Uh, Element O Pies down here on the southwest side. That closed a number of years ago. But uh, Teddy Wedgers right there on the square. It has been a number of years since I've been there. I'm looking forward to going back. Uh, but it is hard to beat a pasty from the UP. And that's what I'm looking forward to over the next several days. Uh, anyway, I hope all of you can be with us for worship this Sunday, either at 9 or 11. I hope you can be present for the class in between those two services at 10. Uh, we are moving into Hebrews chapter 12, and for our members, please remember to use the Sign Up Genius account to sign up for one of the two worship services. It's based on your address in the church directory. Those addresses are kind of pre-approved on that list, as well as anybody else who wants to sign up, who wants to get kind of pre-approved to let you in there, I guess we might say, uh, feel free to get in touch. We'd be glad to add you, but uh, uh, guests are always welcome. We just hope you can join us this Sunday. Uh, tonight, we are continuing with our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, is a history of the early church. It's written by Luke. The beloved physician, he's writing to a man named Theophilus. He's giving him a summary of the beginning of the church, as well as the activities primarily of Peter and then also of Paul. Uh, up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first 11 chapters. And in the ABCs of Acts, we've had the ascension. We've had the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. We had the man who couldn't walk. He was carried and cured in chapter 3. We had the determined disciples who wouldn't stop preaching. In Acts chapter 4 and Acts 5, we had the empty jail. We had the first deacons, but always with a question mark. In Acts chapter 6, in Acts 7, we had Stephen, the great hero. In Acts 8, we had the eunuch's response to Philip's question, Do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch replies, How can I? unless someone guides me. So that was H. In chapter 9, in the vision on the road to Damascus, the Lord identifies himself to Saul by saying, I am Jesus. And so that's chapter 9, I am Jesus. In Acts 10, we had the journey to Joppa, as Cornelius sent messengers there looking for Peter. And in Acts 11, we had the reminder that the kingdom now includes Gentiles, as Peter explains the baptism of Cornelius to the Jews back in Jerusalem. Well, tonight we continue on with Acts chapter 12, and our summary tonight is liberated again, liberated again. And if you can think of something better, feel free to let me know. I'd love to hear from you, but liberated again for Acts chapter 12. Well, our first paragraph tonight is Acts 12 verses 1 through 5, Acts 12 verses 1 through 5. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. Well, right away in verse 1, we're introduced to Herod the king. And I know we've studied the Herods before in uh, multiple studies that we've had here at the congregation, but we should probably uh, do at least a very brief review. Uh, the Herod in this passage is Herod Agrippa I, and it was kind of difficult to find a chart that we could use on the live stream. You know the struggle there, but uh, this is just a screenshot from the Wikipedia article. 
on this particular Herod. So in the chart, the name of Herod Agrippa I is in bold. And then I went ahead and I added a red box and some red highlighting around it just to make sure that we don't miss this one. As I understand it, the Herods were basically descendants of the Edomites. Uh, those were the descendants of Esau who lived down south of Judea. And at one time, their capital city was Petra. And you may remember that Petra was featured in one of the Indiana Jones movies. You may remember the temples and the buildings that were carved in the cliffs there back in that rock canyon. So very easy to defend this place. And so this is where the Herods were from. They were not really Jews. They lived according to some of the Jewish laws. They were kind of distant cousins. Uh, the Herods were appointed by the Romans to rule over Judea. So some kind of backroom deal was made many, many years back. But it was a very tense relationship between the Herodian dynasty, we might say, and the Jewish people. Uh, the Herods didn't really respect the Jews, but the Jews had to obey so as not to be completely annihilated by the Romans. And so it was something of a compromise where it was good for the Herods to get this leadership position and it was somewhat okay for the Jews because they didn't get killed. Uh, the first Herod we see in Scripture is Herod the Great, and he dies in what we now know as 4 BC. Obviously, they were not counting down to the year zero as it got closer and closer. Uh, years ago, somebody asked me, um, if it was counting down to zero, why didn't the people realize that, that this is when Jesus would be born? Well, of course, that's not the way it works, is it? And so our calendars have kind of been uh, reshuffled through the years, trying to make sense of history, different ways of calculating time like that. Um, but Herod the Great dies in what we know to be 4 BC, and that's a slight problem, isn't it? Because this is also the same Herod who spoke with the wise men and killed the baby boys in and around Bethlehem. So if he does this at 4 BC at the latest, this is when he dies, this means that there is no way that Jesus was born in anything that we might consider to be year zero. Um, there's a good chance then that Jesus was not born in zero, if there is such a thing, but he was most likely born somewhere between 4 and 6 BC during the reign of Herod the Great. And I say all of this just to introduce us to this uh, family of the Herods. We have a number of other Herods in this chart, but our focus tonight is on Herod Agrippa I. As I understand it, he would have been the grandson of Herod the Great. So what a family to be born into. Here, this guy uh, persecuting the church is the, the grandson of the great Herod, um, the one who was responsible for killing all the babies around uh, Bethlehem. And uh, this Herod, like his predecessors, I would say was a slimy politician. Um, hard to nail down on some things. He would do whatever was expedient, whatever was good for him and his family. And we absolutely see this going on in Acts chapter 12. So in Acts 12, we find the King Herod starts persecuting the church. Uh, this is not some kind of legal action. There's not really a law that's been broken. The Romans don't seem to be pressuring him to do this. But instead, this is personal. This is for his own pleasure. And we notice here he executes James the Apostle. He has him beheaded, James being the brother of John. He has James put to death with the sword. And when he does this, he sees that it really pleases the Jews. And this, this makes them happy. And so, I know that sounds so strange to us, but we understand that when some people suffer, sometimes others are actually happy about it. When your enemies suffer, it's a common thing to take some kind of pleasure from that. And that's what's going on here. The Jews have been persecuting the church, starting with Peter and John in Acts 4 and 5. Really starting with Jesus before that, but uh, Peter and John in Acts 4 and 5, continuing with Stephen and the persecution led by Saul, and now King Herod gets in on it. Uh, this, by the way, runs in Herod's family, doesn't it? We just noted how the grandfather was the one who killed the baby boys in an attempt to kill Jesus. But we also remember this man's brother, I believe. And I could be wrong, you know, beyond brother and sister, I get kind of messed up on all the family relationships in a chart like that. But I think it was this guy's brother who was the Herod who had John the Baptist beheaded. So I'm not totally positive. Could have been some other relation. I know they were part of the same family, but uh, ultimately... Um, John was beheaded because he continued preaching um, about divorce and remarriage and that whole situation in that family. God disapproved of Herod's illegitimate marriage. So uh, persecution absolutely runs in this family, just a, an evil family, an evil group of people. And because the death of James was so popular, this really 
Got the people happy, got them excited. Herod starts making plans to arrest Peter also. I remember Peter, James, and John, so he's maybe going for the big three, you know, the Lord's inner circle here. And it happens during the days of unleavened bread. We have a few possibilities here. This is when Peter would be in the area. This is when Peter would be most arrestable, we might say. Or another possibility, Herod really wanted to take full advantage of the crowds to make the most people happy with the arrest of Peter. And I'm kind of leaning toward option number two there. Because Luke specifically tells us that Herod does this in order to make the Jews happy. So he has to make sure that they know about it. This needs to be very public, and so he seems to do it during one of those feast days for a reason. In verse 4, we find that when they arrest Peter, Herod has Peter guarded by four squads of soldiers. It's very easy to read through this very quickly and miss it. But why the overwhelming force in this situation? There's kind of some uh, uh, not real, uh, no clarity on this in the commentaries, but as I understand it, a squad would have involved perhaps four soldiers. So we have four squads of soldiers for a total of 16 soldiers. Uh, depending on what the truth is, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly, but uh, uh, varying accounts on this as to the exact number. Uh, but it's obviously a lot, isn't it? A lot of soldiers are guarding one man. Why the huge number of soldiers to guard a single person? Well, we're not told, we do, but we do need to remember that there's some history here, isn't there? There's some history here. Uh, several years earlier, Jesus was somehow able to escape from the tomb, even though it was guarded. But also, Peter has a history of escaping, doesn't he? Himself, personally, Peter. Remember, Acts 5 is empty jail. And that's a reference to the first time Peter was let out of jail by an angel. So as King Herod has Peter arrested, it's not just a matter of putting him under arrest, throwing him in jail somewhere and waiting, but he has Peter guarded by this overwhelming force. He wants to make sure there is no possible way for Peter to escape. And let's also notice King Herod's intent here to bring people out right before the, the, the holiday here. So again, this is to be public. Herod plans to milk this for all it's worth, we might say today. So Peter then is kept in prison until such a time as Herod can get the maximum benefit from this. Uh, but down at the bottom, we have almost a footnote, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. And so on one side, we have Herod using the power and might of the government to try to crush and discourage the church. But on the other hand, we have the church taking their concern to God in prayer. And this little statement will be very important a little bit later in this chapter. Peter is in prison, most likely awaiting execution like James. But meanwhile, the church is praying. So let's continue tonight with Acts 12, verses 6 through 10. Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 10. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared, and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter's side and woke him up, saying, Get up quickly. And his chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Gird yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so, and he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself. And they went out and went along one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. As to what happens next, and as to the timing of this in verse 6, we find that on the very night Herod was going to bring Peter out, probably to have him killed publicly with the sword like James, on that very night Peter is sleeping between two soldiers and he's chained with two chains. Remember, Herod is a little bit overcautious here. Not only is Peter in prison, guarded with two layers of guards, as we find down in verse 10, not only is he between two soldiers, but he is also bound with two chains. So not just one chain, but two chains. As far as the timing, this is at the last possible moment, isn't it? God certainly could have done something sooner. He could have freed Peter the night before this. He could have freed him a week before this if he'd been in prison that long. 
But God has some reason for allowing Peter to be in this place for some period of time. In verse 7, an angel of the Lord shows up. I kind of think it's funny. He shows up suddenly as opposed to showing up gradually. I'm, I'm not sure how that works, but uh, very suddenly an angel of the Lord kind of pops up there inside the prison. There is this light now shining in the cell. The angel strikes Peter in the side to wake him up, get up quickly. Uh, personally, I'm thankful to see a little bit of the humanity of Peter here. The fact that the angel has to strike him to wake him up. Um, almost wonder if Jesus said, hey, <laughs> Can you, you know, kind of get him up, make sure he's up. You know, Peter may have a history there, I don't know. But the angel has to strike him to wake him up. And the fact that he needs to be told to get up quickly is kind of interesting to me. Uh, at this point, the chains fall off his hands. Uh, this is not a failure of the hardware. Uh, this is clearly miraculous. Everything Herod had been trying to do to keep Peter in prison is starting to fall short. Uh, the angel has to tell Peter to um, get dressed or gird himself. Uh, girding, kind of the idea of tucking your your undergarments in your belt kind of to make it easier to run and uh, so get dressed put on your sandals so he's barefoot at, foot at this point he has nowhere to go <laughs> but that has now changed and he's then told to put on his cloak his outer garment his coat and he's told to follow this angel in verse number nine we discover that peter doesn't even know whether this is real uh, it might be a vision. Remember, Peter's the one who just saw the vision full of uh, the sheet, you know, the sheet full of unclean animals being lowered from the sky. And that was a vision, if you remember that. And it was something that was kind of confusing to Peter at first. He had to see it a few times. So now he's not really sure what's going on. What in the world is this? Well, he continues following the angel, though. They pass through the first and second guard. They get to the gate leading into the city. And that gate opens by itself. And they then walk outside, and the angel leaves. And we now pick up with what happens next. The next paragraph is Acts 12, verses 11 through 17. Acts 12, 11 through 17. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent forth his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gate, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing in front of the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. They kept saying, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had led him out of the prison. And he said, Report these things to James and the brethren. Then he left and went to another place. So at the beginning, Peter suddenly realizes this is not a vision. This has really happened. I'm really out of prison. I've been rescued by this angel, and this angel has been sent by God. Uh, so Peter has been liberated again. Again, going back to the title we've given this chapter, Liberated Again. And again, we say again because Peter was also freed by the angel back in Acts chapter 5. At the end of verse 11, we come back to this idea that the Jewish people were expecting something. They were looking forward to this, but God had foiled their plans. He's foiled their plans before. In verse 12, once Peter realizes this is real and not a vision, he heads to the house of Mary, John Mark's mother. Peter knows that the church would be there. They were together and they were praying. Uh, some have speculated that this is perhaps the same house where the uh, Last Supper was held in the upper room. That's just speculation. Um, it was a place large enough for something like that. It was inside the city. Uh, there's some speculation that uh, Mary might have been a... A widow at this point no husband is mentioned so he's out of the picture either he's not a part of this or it's mary's house maybe this maybe she's in business or whatever um, but the uh, church is together in this house this is where they're meeting at this point and they're praying together however notice when peter knocks rhoda the servant girl answers the door and she recognizes peter's voice but she's so happy that instead of letting him in she runs back to tell everybody and at this point, they don't believe her. They think she's out of her mind. Uh, she insists. Uh, they try to convince her it's only Peter's angel. But thankfully, Peter continues knocking, and they finally let him in. 
A few notes here, starting with that reference to Peter's angel. It's kind of unusual to put it in that way. As I understand it, the people back then had the idea that we were perhaps assigned guardian angels, that God gave us each a guardian angel. And I know a lot of people take this to some extreme in terms of speculation. you got the whole it's a wonderful life thing going on, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's not much scripture about this other than the reference uh, here and the reference to something Jesus said back in Matthew 18, verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. That is a weird reference, and I sure do wish Jesus had elaborated a little bit on that. But again, it's just a passing reference. But Jesus in some way seems to confirm this idea that people perhaps have specific angels in heaven, maybe assigned to their care in particular, the idea of a guardian angel. But again, we don't want to build some complex doctrine on this, but I'm just saying we do have these two references to at least consider. Uh, beyond this, we also know angels have been sent out by God to assist or serve or minister to those who will inherit salvation. There's a reference to uh, that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, another note here, the church was apparently praying for Peter's release. But did they believe it when it happened? They'd been praying fervently for this. Uh, do we ever do that today? As we pray, unlike these people, we are to pray with a sense of expectation so we can learn from their failure here, it seems. Uh, the old saying goes, if you pray for rain, you had better carry an umbrella. And I think that makes sense to most of us. We need to pray with an expectant attitude, unlike what these people did. At the end of this paragraph, in verse 17, once he's safely inside, Peter quiets everybody down. It was common to motion with the hand. So I don't know what that was, a wave, holding his hands up, kind of be quiet. He gets everybody quieted down and he tells this story. He goes through it and he lets them know what happened. And then he has them pass all of this along to James and the others. This, by the way, is not the same James who was killed by Herod earlier in this chapter. This is not a contradiction. Uh, we have several James in the New Testament, and we assume this is James, the brother of Jesus. Or to be more accurate, the half-brother of Jesus, same mother, different father, Joseph versus God. Uh, remember, during Jesus' earthly ministry, even his own brothers didn't believe. And uh, that's in John 7, verse 5. In fact, they thought he'd lost his mind. They tried to take him away, perhaps by force, for his own good, uh, so as to not embarrass the family. That's in Mark 3, 21. After the resurrection, though, Jesus makes a special appearance to James in 1 Corinthians 15, 7. And now it is my understanding that James and the other siblings are now believers. Uh, after making sure the people pass this along to James and the others, Peter then moves on. But we still have some unfinished business in this chapter, don't we? So, meanwhile, back in the prison, uh, somebody is in trouble. They have somehow managed to lose their, their, um, their most notorious prisoner over this. So, this is Acts 12, 18, and 19. Now, when day came, there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. When Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. So they've lost their prisoner here and things get pretty disturbing very quickly. Herod even gets involved in this personally. And when it's clear that Peter's gone, Herod examines the guards and has them executed. Uh, Herod then leaves for Caesarea. Caesarea was something of a provincial capital. It was on the coast. Uh, Roman officials would almost always arrive in the port at Caesarea before heading further inland to make their visits in this area. Uh, but let's close tonight by looking at one last paragraph. So this is Acts 12, verses 20 through 25. Acts 12, 20 through 25. Now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace, because their country was fed by the king's country. On an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum, and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, The voice of a god and not of a man! And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and died. 
But the word of the Lord continued to grow and to be multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. Up in verse 20, we have Herod angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Remember, Herod is a self-serving politician, and he's on somewhat shaky ground with the Romans. He can rule as long as he can maintain peace. So whenever things get tense, uh, Herod has a reason to smooth things out, and that's his only reason for smoothing things out. Otherwise, he'd just have his way all the time. Well, these people find a way to get a meeting with Herod. They've won over his uh, chamberlain, Blastus. The chamberlain, I think, kind of the guy in charge of the household, uh, maybe the head butler, steward kind of thing. And they come to discuss this meeting between, uh, the situation between their two nations in this meeting. And Herod, trying to impress these people, uh, comes out in his finest royal clothing. It's kind of hard to argue with a king who's all decked out in the finest clothing. And so Herod comes out and he starts talking. And as he speaks, the people are calling out the voice of a God and not of a man. And if that's all we had, that's a little bit confusing. But based on the context, it sounds like they're maybe referring to King Herod as some kind of a god. Remember the Romans and the Egyptians, many other ancient cultures, had the idea that their leaders were deity in some way. But instead of turning this down or deflecting these comments, King Herod seems to enjoy it. Thank you very much kind of attitude. And because he allows this to continue, we find here that an angel of the Lord strikes him with worms and he is eaten by worms and dies. We actually have a secular record of this in the writings of Josephus, the Jewish Roman historian. Josephus in his writings tells us that Herod appeared before the people that day in a robe made out of silver. It was made with silver thread woven into it. And when the sun hit that garment, it was surprisingly shiny as the sun reflected off that silver. So Herod steps out onto the rostrum to the podium there, and, and he is almost literally glowing. The sun is hitting him, and it's kind of shining in all directions. And Josephus tells us that the people cried out, Be merciful to us, for although we have hitherto referenced you only as a man, yet we shall now from now on consider you to be superior to mortal nature. I've kind of updated the language there. It was rather dated. Um, but uh, that's basically what uh, what the people were saying. So he is no longer a man. We, we consider you to be beyond mortal. Well, Josephus goes on to tell us that a severe pain arose in his belly and began in a most violent manner. If we can imagine what's going on there, I'm kind of surprised Luke held back the way that he did. So it started in a violent manner, violent stomach pain, okay? His pain then became even more violent and severe, and King Herod lingered on for five days like this before dying. This is according to Josephus. And Luke, as a medical doctor, tells us here that he was eaten by worms and died. What a, just a horrible way to go. In terms of practical application here, let's remember that we do not worship mere human beings. That seems to be something we can come away with. And also, we as mere human beings, we do not accept that kind of worship for ourselves. Uh, not that all of us have that problem too often, <laughs> uh, but a number of times in the Bible, people would bow down to angels. Uh, people bowed down to several of the apostles a few times, uh, but they did not accept any worship. They said, get up, I'm just a man, I'm a servant like you, that kind of thing. They, they just deflected that and redirected people. A few weeks ago, I referred to our trip to the Vatican in Rome. Um, that huge gold-covered building is basically one ginormous shrine to the Apostle Peter, St. Peter's Basilica. That's what it's called. Um, there's a statue of him inside, as I referred to a few weeks ago, people standing in line to kiss his toes. Um, all around the top edge of that building and the inside, kind of the crown molding, every word Jesus ever spoke to Peter directly, in all capital letters, in gold, around the outside edge, right at the top of the inside of the ceiling in that building. Six foot tall gold letters all the way around. That building is a shrine to the Apostle Peter. Peter would never accept that kind of worship. But here, King Herod did, and he paid for it with his life. What I find interesting is God did not strike him dead for killing James with a sword, but God does strike him dead for accepting worship. And that right there should probably put this in perspective. 
Uh, at the end here, it seems that the church is vindicated. This man who had been killing and harassing the apostles is now dead. And the word of God continues to grow and to be multiplied. Uh, one of the commentaries pointed out that at the beginning of this chapter, King Herod is in charge and the church is in trouble. And now at the end of the chapter, King Herod is dead and the church is growing. So things have completely reversed themselves from the beginning to the end of this chapter. And at the very end, we have an update on Barnabas and Saul. They finally make their way back to Jerusalem, having completed the mission from Antioch uh, up to Antioch and to bring the new Gentile Christians up to speed. They're back. They have John Mark with them. By the way, one big part of their mission was to bring famine relief back to the elders in Jerusalem. So now they're back, having delivered that relief. And so that mission has now been completed. And if you're familiar with the book of Acts, you probably recognize the combination of Barnabas, Saul, and John Mark. We have these three men together now. So something big is about to happen, and feel free to read ahead. And uh, the stage is set for the second half of Acts, and the gospel is about to move well beyond Judea and Samaria, and is now ready to move into the remotest parts of this earth, as Jesus predicted and instructed in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, next week then, Lord willing, let's pick up with Acts chapter 13 as we come to a pretty big event in the book of Acts. Tonight, though, Peter has been liberated again. So if you can improve on this, liberated again, if you can do better than that for L for chapter uh, 12 here, let me know. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I know it's a sacrifice of our time, uh, but it's important for us as a congregation to study together and to keep up with this. I hope you can be present for Worship Sunday at uh, 9 or 11 and plan on being present for uh, the study of Hebrews in between those two services at 10. Come prepared for Hebrews chapter 12. If you're a member of the church, a member of the congregation, this would be a great time to sign up. Let me know if I can help with that. If you're a guest, just come. We want you to be there on Sunday. And uh, let me also know, let me know if you have anything that we need to be praying about. I would really appreciate that. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of James and Peter. And we know tonight that you listen to the prayers of your people. We're thankful for Luke and for his record of the growth of the early church. We're thankful for your providential care, not only for those early disciples, but for us as well. You have been so good to us. Thank you for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. You are the great God and King above all others, and we've seen that tonight. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.